refrigerator for I don't know how long now. Do you have to see it? Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. Pulpit. Then all I can say is it it is extraordinary. It is just extraordinary and the the, the um thought that I just felt the Lord gave me for this stuff today was ordinary people extraordinary God mm. ordinary people so just for a few minutes I'm going to whiz through a couple of chapters in Acts it will be a, a real whiz and if you want to go to sleep then I can guarantee you don't feel as tired as I do now so. <laughs> Jeff, there was a man uh, I heard about a minister who who dreamt that he was preaching at Westminster Chapel, and when he woke up, he was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I'll tell you a story. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you another story. This is true. My, my brother-in-law's father was getting, was getting quite frail and uh, frequently fell asleep in church, which is okay. And um, so he'd fallen asleep in this, in this service a while back. And, and, uh, and the preacher was droning on and on, you know, as they do. And um, I can say that being a preacher. And, uh, and suddenly, suddenly, I don't know, he suddenly he must have just woken up and he went, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after, after the service, he, he went and apologised to the preacher guy. He said, well, I, I think I must have been dreaming or something. But my brother-in-law said, he said, well, that may have been true, but 30 people said, Amen. <laughs> 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 uh, I think I've met many <coughs> people over my, my life who seem to be extraordinary. Have you, you know, mm -hmm. just seem to be extraordinary people. I remember when I was 22, Travelling across Africa and uh, coming to a, an orphanage and meeting a, a lady called Lily Sportner. And um, she had been a, a nurse uh, in the Second World War, trained in the Second World War, and at the end of the Second World War went out to Africa as a, as a young nurse, aged about 30, to work among, on a, a leprosy mission in a place called Chitokoloki in what was then uh, northern Rhodesia. And um, while she was there, very soon after she was there, she came across a, a thing that was happening in the culture of the, the day there. If a woman died in childbirth, which was very um, common, um, and the baby survived, they, they didn't know what to do with the baby, they, and and so they they were they used to bury the live child with the dead mother, and um, you know they she kind of challenged this and said, "Is there not anything else you can do?" And they said, "Well, there's nothing we can do. There's no milk. You know, the baby will die, but we don't. We you know we against our morality to kill it. But you know, what can we do?" And so she said, there must be something. And anyway, anyway, very shortly after she talked to some of the people about this, the, the same incident happened again. And as they were about to bury this little tiny baby with its dead mother, the grandmother snatched it away and ran to the hospital where Lilia Sportner was and get the gate and said, here's a, here's a child. You know, you said you might do something with it. And so, so here's a young nurse of 30 years old with a, with a day old baby. And, um, and, so, and suddenly the, the word went round the, the community, There's another, there might be another way that we can do this. And within, I think, four or five weeks, she had six babies. Mm. Now, can you imagine being a 30-year-old and having six newborn babies to look after? And she, she didn't know what to do. She... she, she the, the, the hospital said they, they didn't want to be involved, but she just felt that God had given her this to do. Mm. And she took these six, six newborn babies, walked off into the bush uh, about another 
uh, 10 miles, I think, to the east, and built her own home with her own hands. And over her lifetime, she saved 600 babies, one for every month for 50 years. Wow. And when I met her, it was like it was like I was in the presence of an angel. You know, she was she just she was just and she but she said to me, I'm just an ordinary nurse. That was her word. I'm an ordinary nurse. But somehow, because God was in the thing, she was doing the, in, an yeah. extraordinary thing. Yeah. And the Bible the Bible is full of stories of ordinary people yeah. who did extraordinary things because of their faith in God mm. and through their faith in God. A slave who became second in command to an Egyptian pharaoh. Mm. A desert shepherd who became the deliverer of a nation. Mm. A farmer who defeated an invading army with a handful of inexperienced men. Mm. A sex worker who became significant in Messiah's ancestry. Mm. The shepherd boy who became perhaps the greatest king of all time. A young Jewish girl who became queen of Persia. An exiled teenager who became chief administrator in Babylon. A cupbearer who built a city. And some fishermen who led the church and turned the world upside down. Mm. And it's actually to that last story that I want to just turn and whiz you through in as short a time as I can. Acts chapter 2 is the story that I want to go to. Oh, sorry, Acts chapter 3. I'll start to read. Is this okay? Yeah, yeah thank God. <laughs> One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. A couple of fishermen. Jewish law made it a duty to pray three times a day. Uh, in Psalm 55, David says that he cries out to the Lord evening and morning and noon. Um, and do, you remember, do you remember Daniel praying three times? a day when he was in <coughs> exile and then he gets thrown into the lion's den. Do you remember that story? Mm. Incidentally, I don't, I don't know if you know, but Daniel was probably about 85 when he got thrown into the lion's den. Yeah. And Peter and John are on their way up. They're good Jews to pray in the temple. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. It's the, the what they call the minkar prayer, the afternoon prayer, and the main prayers at that time of day were what they called the Shimone Estre, it was, that means the 18, and it was simply they, they went through 18, well actually it's 19, but they call it 18, okay. <laughs> you want to ask me about that later. And they've entered the outer court of the temple, um, we call it the court of the Gentiles, and then you go across that court, up some, up towards uh, another courtyard, which is called the Courtyard of Women. And then you go through that court, and then you go up some more steps into the courtyard of the, the Israelite people. So they're on their way through, and they've come through the outer court, and they're just coming up to the Courtyard of Women. And they, a gate is called the Beautiful Gate. We think it's this gate anyway, but not really sure. And it's called the Nicanor Gate. It's a, it's a gate covered in bronze. Beautiful, shining with the sun on it. And, they, and, just, and there the man sat. Well, actually, as, as they were coming, I think the man is being carried in. It says. So they're going into prayer, and suddenly as they're coming into <coughs> prayer, the man is just being put down by his friends, or maybe his family, to, to beg. It was a good place to beg, actually, because everybody went into the courtyard of women. To, that was where the money boxes were. So if you wanted to give your offering, 
of money either to go up. So, so it's a great place to beg. So he was just being put down there, and, and Peter and John are just going in to pray the 18. The second prayer in the 18 praises God for his might and his power and mentions his power to heal the sick and raise the dead. The eighth prayer in the 18, I won't go through them all, the eighth prayer in the 18 is a prayer for God to raise the sick. The 18th prayer, the last one, is thanks to God for his miracles every day. They're, they're just about to go in and praise God for all that he can do and that he can raise the sick and do heal anything and do miracles every day. And suddenly they see a man who's been brought in, who's been lame since the time he was born. He's never walked. I think it's interesting he was carried in and he obviously couldn't walk at all. And he did the first verse. Now, a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But what I... How have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Walk and taken him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped to his feet and began to walk, and then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. And when all the people saw, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Woo -hoo -hoo. <laughs> Those amazing words, silver and gold have I not, but what I do have I give to you. The story of the 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas, some of you will know. The story, he was visiting Pope Innocent IV in Rome and found him, so it said, counting out a large sum of money. You see, Thomas, said the Pope, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none. <laughs> and Thomas replied, true, holy father, but it would seem that also she can no longer say, rise up and walk. And this man had never walked. He never had strength. And suddenly he's leaping and jumping all around the temple. And people are going in, into prayer time. And there's a commotion. It says the people are in wonder and amazement. And they're running to Peter and John. Now, now those simple fishermen have retreated back to what's called Solomon's Colonnade on the other side, backwards towards the other side of the courtyard of Gentiles was part of the temple where the believers used to meet um, most days. Actually, it was the, the only part of Solomon's temple that was still standing. And Peter suddenly sees all these people running towards They're all astonished. They can't believe what they've seen. They're running towards him, and there's a huge commotion. And, and Peter launches into the most incredible preach. Incredible. I would love to be able to preach like this. And he said, why, why, why are you amazed? What's your problem? You know, do you think we did this by our own power? We're just fishermen. He says, no. He says, this is through the name of Yeshua, of Jesus, of Nazareth. He said, you, and anyway, he starts pointing at him. He says, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate. You disowned the holy and righteous one and preferred a murderer. You killed the... And then he goes into this kind of poetry. You killed the author of life. But God raised him up. 
And he goes on, he says, okay, 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 you did it out of ignorance. But know this, that Jesus was actually the prophet that Moses talked about all those years ago. And then, you remember back in Mo Moses, he said, one day, well, it was when the, when the Jewish people and, and Moses had gone up to, to the mountain to be with God and the, and the people said, well, we, we don't want to hear anything. We, we, we'll shrink away. You go, Moses. And then, and then when Moses came, Moses said, actually, one day a prophet will come that you must listen to. You must listen to. One day he will come. And the, the people down through the centuries have been saying, is this a prophet? Is this a prophet? And of course, Jesus was that prophet. And, and, and Peter says, okay, you did it out of ignorance, didn't what you did, but Jesus was the prophet that Moses spoke about. And you must listen to what he has said. And he said, repent and believe, and you must repent, and you must turn to God. What a preach. Imagine. It's fantastic. And actually, what a response. If you, if you read on, the Bible says that the number of the church increased that day to about 5,000. We think it had been about 3,000 before. That means like a couple of thousand people turned to Jesus that day. And remember, remember all this is happening inside the temple. It's not, not in some back alley. And there's a huge commotion. And, and the temple guard now are running everywhere, trying to find out what's going on. And the, and the, and the, the law lords that they're in their fine robes. And they've all been trying to go up into a prayer meeting. And suddenly this commotion. And the priests and the Sadducees, it says they're greatly disturbed. Actually, it says the Sadducees were greatly disturbed because of all this talk about resurrection. They didn't believe in resurrection. I, I can imagine them saying, we, we can't hear ourselves in the prayer meeting for all this commotion. <laughs> and Peter, Peter's saying, well, well, what were you praying? In there? Were you not praying that people would be healed? <laughs> and they didn't like it. And they haul them off to prison. And the following day, they're brought back before the Jewish law lords. The, they called it the Sanhedrin. It was, it was the 71 law lords. 71 law lords and the high priest. Or actually, strangely, two high priests here. Because there was a man called Annas and then a man called Caiaphas. And presumably they brought Peter and John, the, these two ordinary fishermen, in front of these two high priests and the other law lords in the high priest's palace, just to the south of the temple. <coughs> and if that was the case, then Peter had been to that place before. Actually, just a few weeks mm. earlier. He stood in the courtyard of that palace and watched as his master Jesus had been abused in front of Annas and then Caiaphas. Actually, technically, Annas was not high priest at this time. He had been removed as high priest in AD 15 by the Roman procurator of the time. He'd been high priest for about 10 years. But I don't, I don't fully know what happened here, but it, 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 Annas was obviously such a powerful man. And in such a powerful family, and in such a powerful sect, the Sadducees were like the rich top. And he, this, this man, although he was deposed by the Roman, you can't be high priest anymore, it, it, although he'd been deposed from that, somehow he managed, he had five sons. And he managed to put each of his five sons as high priest in turn 
and his son-in-law, Caiaphas. So he had, he had effectively had five sons and a son-in-law. He put each of them as high priest in turn, and in, in doing so, kind of kept control of everything. And Peter and John, a couple of ordinary fishermen, are hauled up in front. Actually, incidentally, I, I'm not sure about this one, but I'll throw it out to you and see if you catch it. Um, I wonder, do you, do you remember the story of that Jesus told about the rich man and Lazarus in uh, Luke's Gospel? And he talks about the, these two men dying. He said there's a rich man a very rich man and he died and, and a poor man and he died and they both went and, and the poor man is taken to Abraham's bosom and the, and the rich man ends up in hell and uh, he calls out to Abraham, you know, can you not get Lazarus to come and you know, give some water and cool my tongue and he says no I can't do that because there's a gulf between us and then, he, and, then he says, and then he says well if you can't do that could you not send somebody back from the dead and then he says to my father and five brothers. And, and the Bible says this rich man was dressed in purple and fine linen. In, uh, in Exodus it talks about the garments of Aaron and the high priest as being purple and fine linen. Wow. And I just wonder if, if Jesus was not talking prophetically about Caiaphas. Wow. And that... that, that uh, uh, because later on Lazarus did rise from the dead. Didn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. And what did Caiaphas do? They tried to kill him again. Yeah. Anyway, that's uh, just by the by. And Peter, that's a Peter and John are back in that same courtyard where Peter had been a few weeks before, where he'd been so fearful, cowering up in a corner by the fire and scared to be identified with Jesus across the other side, perhaps scared to be hauled up in front of Annas and Caiaphas himself. And now he is, in that same place, in front of those same people. But this time, this time, he doesn't seem scared at all. In fact, this time, wow. It's by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified. <laughs> this is Annas and Caiaphas, the two most powerful men in Eretz Israel. You crucified, and God raised from the dead that this man has been healed. You were supposed to be spiritual builders, and you rejected the capstone. There is no other name by which we must be saved. Don't seem to be afraid at all. And the high priests and the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law, the 71, it says they were astonished. And then it says, because they realised that these were ordinary, unschooled men. Just ordinary men. Behaving in the most extraordinary way. Caiaphas and Annas and the, and the Lord, they, they, they are taken aback by these two. And they say, these, these, these are just ordinary guys. They've had no education. And, and then it says, 
them. But they took note that they had been with Jesus. Oh. And that was what made the difference. Big, ordinary people. But an ordinary, an extraordinary God. And I, don't, don't you love this? Don't you look at this? I, I mean, it's been two years now since I've seen that. And uh, I look at it, and I'm going, wow. You know, I'm going, wow. This is just, just extraordinary. And yet, and yet I look around, and they look like ordinary people. <laughs> so what's making the difference? I think because Jesus is. When uh, one, one day um, six young guys came to stay with Patsy and me for a while, they were part of a group called Team Challenge. <laughs> you come across Team Challenge. They were just young guys, ordinary guys. All of them had been drug addicts. And God had done extraordinary things. In the, I mean, unbelievable things in the lives of these young guys. But, uh, and they stayed with us for a while and were a great blessing to us. But um, they were telling me, they were telling me one day, we sit down and they were talking and they were saying, they were saying, there had just been some the two big um, surveys in America, and Teen, uh, teen Challenge was very big in America. So there had just been two big um, surveys in America where um, people had been, the government had been looking at uh, how different organisations that were working in drug addiction were performing, and they said, they said all the, all the organisations, the secular ones, that were pretty much the same, um, and they had a success rate after I think about five years of about ten percent success rate. But when they came to look at Team Challenge, their success rate was eighty-seven percent. And at, at the end of the report, they, 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 they said they couldn't see any significant difference in the program. They said it's just an ordinary drug addiction program like any others, except for one thing, that these people were offering Jesus. And they, they, they called it the Jesus Factor. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? The Jesus Factor. And here's a couple of ordinary fishermen doing extraordinary stuff because of the Jesus Factor. They didn't know what to do with them. They said they Actually, they couldn't agree with what to do with them. They couldn't argue with the truth that the lame man who had been lame for over 40 years was suddenly leaping about in their temple. And that all Jerusalem was in a commotion because of it. And so they commanded, it says they commanded them not to go and speak or teach anymore in this name. You must not do this. And Peter and John said, okay, then we were. No, they didn't. They said, sorry, we, we can't do that because we can't help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after that, it said, they threatened them further and then let them go because they didn't know what else to do. Bit like Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Ordinary people doing extraordinary things through an extraordinary God. One last little story. Any of you will know this one. In 1934, 
in the middle of America's Great Depression. A young farmhand was working on a, a rundown farm in North Carolina. <coughs> the uh, farm had been hit badly by the Depression and the farmer had lost nearly all his money. But this young farm had him, farmhand, his name was Albert McMakin. He was 24 and a Christian. And he carried on working for the farmer. And uh, one day a travelling preacher came to town and young Albert tried to round up as many of his friends and the other farm workers to take them to these evening meetings in his pickup truck. And uh, many of them uh, agreed to go, but the uh, farmer's son, they called him Billy Frank, refused to come. He was, he was 15, nearly 16, but he was more interested <coughs> in girls and baseball. He'd actually been a bit of a tear away, I think. He'd, he'd been refused membership of the local youth club because they said he was too worldly. And he said he didn't want to go. But uh, Albert McMakin was quite persuasive and said that if, uh, if he would come, he could drive the truck. So 15-year-old lad thought, cool. So he went. Heard this preacher, and he was hooked. He was fascinated. He went back the following night, and the following night, right through to the final night, when he gave his heart to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That young lad went on to preach, personally, to over 215 million people mm -hmm. in 185 countries. <coughs> it said that over half the world's population heard him preach either on radio or on TV. He became the confidant of nine American presidents. In 1996, one televised broadcast of him preaching reached an audience of 2.5 billion people. It's estimated that 3.2 million people responded to his invitation to accept Christ as their personal saviour. Most of us today don't remember him as just Billy Frank, but Billy Franklin Graham. But Albert McMakin, I can't, I've tried actually, but I haven't managed to find anything else about him. He was, after all, just an ordinary guy. Mm. <laughs> or was he? Mm. Bless you, Phil. Yeah.